we go. Well, welcome everybody uh, to the last of our series of aquatic invasive or basically invasive species uh, webinar. Um, I'm John Navarro. I'm with the ODNR Division of Wildlife, and I'm the Aquatic Invasive Species Program Administrator. So if you've been following the series, we've had a lot of great talks, some general, some about invasive um, insects and plants. And um, we're going to finish off with a bang here, and uh, we're going to bring in a uh, an animal that's um, become quite a problem in the South. Uh, be, it is getting a foothold in Ohio, and it's the wild boar. And if anybody didn't know it, we do have them in Ohio. So um, we're going to have uh, one of the experts on wild boars um, speak to you today. It's a uh, Tyler Genders. He's with the um, Ohio Department of Agriculture, and he's with the APHIS group, and I will let him explain what that acronym stands for. But um, Tyler's going to talk about um, wild boars. Some of you might know it as Hogzilla. Um, there's been some uh, really interesting shows on these, these critters, but they're a real problem, and I'm glad there's people out there that, that are working on it. So um, you, you can see the uh, titles of the other talks we've had, those are all now available um, at that link. And so you can you can view all the talks and then Tyler's will be available probably in a week or two. I'm not sure how long it takes for those to get posted. So I'm going to hand it over to um, Tyler and um, he's out of Groveport, Ohio, and he's going to be talking about um, something I think is really interesting and it's the wild boar. How's everyone doing today? Um, thank you, John, for the introduction. I do appreciate it. Um, I'm with USDA Wildlife Services. My name is Tyler Genders, like he mentioned. I'm a wildlife disease biologist and feral swine coordinator for the state of Ohio. We work explicitly with feral swine, um, most of the majority in the southern part of the state. We'll go in more detail with that, but I do want to give a brief introduction of myself. I uh, graduated from Ohio State University and uh, pursued a wildlife services job and started as a technician, got on as a feral swine technician, and that started back in 2014 where everything really began. From there, I was fortunate enough to get the wildlife disease biologist position and travel all across the country doing various different types of things. But my main focus in the state is working with feral swine. You look at this picture, in this slide, you look at every one of these different specimens and you look at them and all of these are non-invasive species or non-native invasive species. And each one of these holds a different or has terrorized different ecosystems throughout our native species. And looking into it, feral swine are no different at all. To accept the presence of feral swine is the same as thinking Asian carp or gypsy moths are great for Ohio's ecosystems. Feral swine or scientific name Suscrofa um, they're not native, non-native invasive species, and our biggest concerns with these animals are they're threatened to human health and safety, damaged habitat, and damaged agriculture, which we'll so see pictures here shortly, and they compete with native wildlife for valuable resources and outcompete them in most cases. So this is a generalized U.S. population map in 2019 by county, so it seems a little bit full, but it's overall we have roughly 35 states with feral swine currently and over the population size is roughly 6 million and rapidly increasing. So Ohio's population, this is a 2020 population map. It has changed slightly and we are dealing with a few other populations that popped up, one in Tuscarawas County and one in Champaign County. Um, but overall, these are the main known breeding populations that have been established to Ohio for some time now. Adams County, Athens County, Gallia, Hawking, Jackson, Lawrence, Scioto, and the main hub for Ohio has been Benton County. So feral swine by definition, what are feral swine? It's a very complicated situation that varies from state to state, but they're listed under the Ohio Administrative Code listed right there. As feral swine means any swine has spent any of its life free roaming or outside of captivity. And now it is illegal to transport, transport any trapped swine in Ohio, 
but it is legal to trap them as long as you immediately euthanize them on, on location. Feral swine and in Ohio in general are a variety of different types of pigs. As we mentioned, any pig that spent any part of its life outside of captivity is considered feral. So you have Russian, Eurasian style, style pigs, as you can see in the bottom left hand corner, a very bulky stance, broad shoulders, and kind of elongated snout with a mostly straight tail. Or we have hybrids where the domestic pigs ex escaped from a farm or were released and bred with these the Eurasian pigs. And then you have what is called the hybrid pig. And you can see domestic traits and Eurasian traits in both of these. And typically what we're finding out is a lot of these domestic traits when they breed or domestic swine, when they breed with these Eurasian style pigs can produce more pigs. And that is a big problem we see in the South where we have red pigs, spotted pigs, striped pigs, and every other type of pig you can think of. As I mentioned previously, one of the main characteristics you can see in a truly domestic swine compared to a feral swine, feral swine have a very elongated snout, almost flat as in the picture, whereas the domestic swine or the pink pig that you think of has that more flat forehead and is very elongated upwards and not as flat as you can see in the feral swine image. Reproduction. This is probably the biggest cause of why they're so such a problem and so invasive and compete with so many other native species. Feral swine by far are probably the most prolific large mammal on earth. It takes exactly three, 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 three months, three weeks, and three days in ge for gestation, which means giving birth and having the piglets, and another probably six to eight weeks of weaning roughly, and then those pigs will start eating hard food, and then we found sows with piglets roughly that around that age, two months old, that already set, are already pregnant again. So they're very prolific and they produce a lot of piglets when they cross with domestics and it's become a very big problem. Disease threat. Um, as a wildlife disease biologist, this is the other side we take. We take a variety of different types of samples and feral swine in general can carry up to 30 different types of diseases and 40 different types of parasites that can affect humans, livestock and wildlife. So how do we handle these invasive species? There's a lot of different methods and a lot of things you can see or find on the internet about the best methods to use. Well, you typically we're utilizing ATVs or UTVs and traps. Traps have been the most effective system we've been able to implement to removing large amounts of pigs and continue to trap 365 days a year just remote using remote camera systems as well. We also use and utilize specialized firearms in certain situations to remove single pigs off the landscape or to help relieve damage off crops or any other types of damage in yards, et cetera, and mitigate those. So we utilize the trap system overall and that remote camera system to minimize the risk of non-targets. And this is the biggest thing where typically in the past we ran what is called a trip trigger system. Basically, it's a wire that runs to a trigger, trigger mechanism that releases that gate to go down. And what that allows is it allows for domestic dogs to come in, white-tailed deer to enter the trap and trigger it, and even cattle, or in the top right picture, a family of bobcats. So it is extremely important for us to continue to do our job effectively by minimizing those trap or non-target catches. And that goes all back to the mine camera system. These are a Jaeger Pro camera system. These cellular devices send pictures, those images to our cell phones directly, and then we can request photos or we can send commands to that to do whatever function we may want. You can see in these particular photos, we know now can focus on trying to capture a whole entire sounder or a family of pigs. And that allows us in the bottom pictures, you can see we have a group of pigs entering, and this just happened this morning, by the way, we have a group of pigs entering the trap. We can still see in the next picture in the middle that they're not all in the trap. And then to the bottom right, you can see that once they were all in the trap, we were able to drop it and effectively remove that whole sounder. This, this also leads to not educating pigs on the outside. Pigs become very weary when they experience damage, extremely smart animals, and can be leery of traps, bait, and any efforts we would have to use in the future to try to remove them off the landscape. This is kind of a funny thing, but we do believe pigs can fly. We've seen it um, hand, uh, more than a handful of times where we've seen pigs come and get out of these corral traps. These are 60 inch panels, so they're very tall, roughly five feet. And uh, they 
they can go through it, over it, and under it if they want to. So it's a very important for us to, to respond to trap catches in a timely manner. One, we don't want the pigs to be in there for a very long time, inducing any other type of unnecessary stress, but also allows us to capture or remove that whole entire sounder. It's uh, interesting to note this picture is from a large boar, roughly 350 pounds, that escaped three different traps and took us roughly four years to remove off the landscape. A very smart and very educated pig, and he knew exactly what he was doing. So what other types of equipment do we use for you know, this process? You know, We use methods such as aerial gunning, which is uh, operation basically utilizing and removing pigs from a helicopter. We use drones, USA drones is basically, we have to have a certified pilot to fly these drones, and these drones have uh, given it, or enabled us to look at fields in a very short amount of time. You can see in that picture, this is what we call, it's not a crop circle, I promise, but it's uh, where pigs get in the middle of the field or in these edge of the fields where they feel covered and protected. And they'll do, basically, it looks like a steamroller growing through there. And they're knocking down all the corn so they can then eat it. And what would take us in this particular field is roughly 300 acres. What would take us multiple days to transect that whole entire field to find the damage now can be done in a matter of five minutes. So it is saving time and money, and it is a very unique tool to use as well. Telemetry data is also known as what we call a Judas pig, and that allows us, what we do is we'll capture a group of pigs, we'll attach a GPS collar to it in a comfortable manner around the pig, and we release it back onto the landscape. From there, that allows that pig, for us to track that pig all over the place, whether it's meeting up with another group or spending more time on a different property, and we can see this varies from pig to age class and to even gender. Fairly well, sows stay in a smaller area than boars. Boars are typically moving a lot. We've seen a single boar move as much as six miles in one night. So it can be very, very different, but we've learned a ton from the telemetry work that we've been doing. I spoke about this already, but the Judas pig, you can see this kind of an image of three different pigs that we have caught and captured and put a, a collar on. Um, it's kind of the orange collar is typically the best. It's easier to see as in the middle picture, you can see you have a brown collar and that's more difficult to see or find on the landscape. We learned that the hard way. Basically, these devices have a, a time mechanism. Once they've been on for so long, they'll detonate so they're not embedding into the pig or causing any hurt or any damage to the pig. But basically, they'll detonate and they'll be left on the landscape, whether it's in a clear cut thicket or the most disgusting place you can think of in the middle of the woods. And we have to go try to relocate it or try to find it. And it's very difficult to find it when it's uh, brown and covered in mud. But so far this time, we've uh, this up to this time, we've had 11 different Judas pigs and we've seen data this far from Gallia, Sayota, Denton, Hawking and Adams counties. Oh. So what do you think sign wise when you're walking through the woods? What do you expect to find or how do you know pigs have been in the area? Well, there's several different things that pigs are pretty good at doing and it's definitely playing in the mud and causing a lot of sign. Wallows are the one of the biggest tall tail things. Usually this is a wet area or as you can see, this was a vernal pool, which is very important for a lot of native species, but they utilize it as their bathtub and they're rubbing in there, cooling themselves down. Pigs naturally cannot sweat, so they have to utilize this, me this method to put rub mud on their bodies to cool down during the hot summer times. Mud rubs are kind of exactly what they sound like. These pigs will go up to a tree and they'll start rubbing on the tree and just slathering mud up and down that tree. And basically what they're trying to do is one, get excess mud off, but also remove any types of parasites or anything on their body that they're trying to get out. And it probably feels good too. You see pigs rubbing a lot. Tusk marks, we see this uh, usually on rub trees or trees that you use as territorial marks, but basically the boars will come up to it and nudge their head into it, creating and sharpening their tusk as well and taking their teeth and gouging the tree. And it kind of leaves these long gashes and they're pretty, pretty easily identifiable. Tracks in general, um, we'll talk about this in one second. I got a better picture and we're also going to look at scat. Scat overall is uh, different between different species and pigs overall have a very flat or pancake style, style kind of scat and it's a uh, pretty identifiable um, overall and we'll take a quick I think I might have a picture of that no I do not okay but here you can see in the top left picture we have what I was calling those tusk marks long engages or gouges out of the tree and also on a mud rub the center picture right there is a mud rub and then another very good territorial mud rub in the top right hand corner 
Um, bottom right hand corner, you can see this pig is rubbing as we talked about those mud rubs again, but that's the process of it. I wish I had a video for you, but we lost it when we got when I got my new computer. Um, and then the most identifiable thing as far as trying to compare it to deer is tracks. As you can see in that bottom left hand corner, the bottom of that pad is rounded and connected. And more so or not in deer, you'll have elongated pads that are not connected in the back. And it's pretty identifiable once you really start to pay attention and look at these things. Hey, Tyler, quick question. Yeah. Um, a bit ago, you talked about um, where reports or sightings were, but um, we have a question. What is the estimated population of wild boar in Ohio? And that's the most difficult thing for us to answer. We talk about uh, telemetry data has given us a lot of information. We know these pigs are moving up to six miles in a single night. So to understand the actual population of it, it's very difficult and Ohio is very segmented. We don't have a lot of continuous land or single property owners, which allows us, does, what doesn't allow us to access a lot of different properties as well. To give an overall estimation would be very difficult. We don't like to tell anything we can say it's less than 10,000 for sure, and probably more than a thousand. And that is a guess. That is a rough guess at the most. So like this is one of the scenarios where it's such a prolific species and it's so good at hiding as most invasives are. It makes it very difficult to answer that question. All right, thanks. So moving on, looking at damage, we're going to talk about rooting the crop fields, which I mentioned in the utilizing the drone and then erosion. You look at different methods of this, this individual right here in the bottom left-hand quarter, which it looks like uh, rooting was conducted right in front of his barn. He did not want us to remove the pigs. He enjoyed hunting the pigs. And this happened a week after we had reached out to him. He immediately called us and wanted our help. And we were able to get on that property and remove those pigs from there. Um, you can also see what rooting can cause up in the top right picture, a lot of erosion. When these pigs are digging up and turning up and creating loose soil, it's taking away and then exposing to weather, wind, etc., and exposing these roots, which can actually kill those trees as well. The bottom right hand corner is a very interesting scenario. Uh, a gentleman had roughly about four acres of mobile pasture or yard in more than the lack of a better term. And these pigs were destroying it every single year, causing thousands and thousands of repair damage to try to keep his yard or pasture in a maintain in a, a manageable order, to say the least. Looking more at damage, this is a perfect example of crop fields. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, it looks like a steamroller goes through and this allows the pigs, the adult pigs to push over the stocks and allows them to eat, but also the piglets to eat. Um, another really good picture of a drone we were able to follow this creek with the drone you can see that damage right there in the middle of that picture on the on the top right very very useful tool and allows us to really locate these pigs and it's estimated with management efforts that pigs do roughly 1.5 billion dollars worth of damage every single year in the u.s so and that's that's a very conservative number to say the least More pictures of damage. Like I said, you've seen the picture in the very bottom, but this is just a very indicative, easy way to find damage and uh, very important for us to assess where we need to be on the landscape. Very indicative tale where pigs have been. So what are our future goals? This is um, the number one question. Eradication of damaging feral swine will help ensure the habitat of our native species, provide less competition for resource, less risk for disease, protect agricultural fields and crops. Continue to do outreach, that's the biggest thing for us. Um, the more, just like most people, when you probably look at this presentation, you didn't even know wild pigs were on the landscape. So outreach is a very important method for us and we do a ton of outreach. Um, COVID-19 and COVID in general has very restricted most of this. So we're very thankful to be on this, uh, this webinar, but uh, outreach is huge for us. And then just protecting our wildlife and uh, our people and our agriculture. It's kind of a shorter presentation than what I'm used to. I can answer any more questions for you guys. Um, I appreciate being able to be on here. Kind of went a little bit faster than I thought it was going to. And then I also wanted to leave my contact information for you guys. Anyone that wants to report feral swine or has questions on feral swine, we are more than willing to help you guys in any way we can. Thanks, Tyler. Um, a couple questions. Uh, why do wild pigs grow tusks? Uh, tusks are a very tutorial kind of measure, like even domestic swine will grow tusks, um, but typically they are removed. But 
in general, what they'll do, they'll compete with other boars in the area to breed with those sows or um, or as to mark the territory as well, but mostly to, to defend their area to, uh, so they can breed with those sows. OK, and then um, last question that we have, um, what is the power of their bite and also what do they eat? Uh, typically, feral swine eat everything. They can eat basically anything they want to get a hold of as far as uh, reptiles, amphibians. Uh, we've had reports of predation on fawns, livestock, and they do love corn. That's their biggest method. They do a lot of crop damage to soybean fields as well, but crop corn in general is their big main diet as far as what we deal with. Overall, they will eat anything they can get their mouth on. I don't know the overall rating as far as the bite, but uh, I'm assuming it's going to be pretty good. It's very strong to be able to do what it does. All right, um, John, I don't know if you have any questions or if you want to wrap it up, um, but feel free to chime in. If Sure. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Tyler. That was uh, a fascinating. I'm the one that asked the stupid tusk question. I just I didn't know domestics um, pigs had tusks, but the yeah, farmers kind of a misconception where people think that when domestic pigs get out, they turn to this rabid, feral, yeah. just this animal out of nowhere, like it morphs or something like that. But that's yeah. not typically the case. Like a lot of times the, they're not maintained or they're moving a lot. You'll see a lot of, you know, longer, elongated hair probably, or they, or they, you know, they also die during the winter time because they have such short hair, mostly domestic breeds. So like, that's it's not it's pretty much a myth as far as this okay. mystical transformation. Well, thanks for that talk and um, thanks for trying to keep them out of Ohio and being a uh, nature guy. Uh, they are pretty damaging um, so to our native wildlife, so appreciate it. Um, like I said, this talk and all the others will be available at the link. Um, so yeah, that's it. So I uh, appreciate everybody listening to the um, invasive species series. It's 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 been really uh, informative. All right.